and welcome to Interfaith Connections. I am your host, Jackie Fuller. Today, we are going to chat with Lauren Horton Lundweg, who is the Associate Minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church, or congregation, I should say, in Fairfax, Virginia. Reverend Lauren, thank you for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you, Jackie. It's a pleasure. Sure, no problem. Can you share with our audience some background information about yourself? Oh, sure. Well, I've been serving in ministry since 2005. Um, I've been in Fairfax County for about two years. And prior to that, I was serving a congregation in Northern California. And also, I've worked in Chicago. So I've had a chance to move around a little bit. My home is in Minnesota. I'm a Midwesterner okay, okay. in my heart, but I've got a lot of family connections on the East Coast as well. So it's been great to be back here. Okay. So, yeah. And can you share with us some information about the Unitarians? Sure, by all means. So my congregation has kind of a long name. It's the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. And the reason we have this long name is that um, it, for about 50 years, we've been, uh, we've been one movement called Unitarian Universalism. But prior to that, for hundreds of years, there were separate groups, the Unitarians and the Universalists. And so um, for, for hundreds of years, the Unitarians, I would say the big thing I want your listeners to, to, to understand is that the Unitarians were saying that people have the right and the responsibility to figure out for themselves what they believed when it comes to religion. So that's really different from what a lot of churches teach. And so we've always put a lot of emphasis on freedom of belief and then the responsibility that goes, for, that, that goes with that, that, that we really hope that people will do the work of figuring out where, where their beliefs are and what, what they believe and where that comes from. So that's the Unitarians side. And then we have this other piece, the Universalists. And again, this goes back hundreds of years. The Universalists, their big message was, um, if they, in their world, a lot of people believed that God was going to condemn people to hell. And it was a very scary, scary kind of religion. The Universalists were saying, we think that God loves people so much that nobody's going to have to go to hell. Everybody's going to be saved. So they were preaching universal salvation. That's how we got the name. Oh, okay. So, you know, so down, over the years, we've changed somewhat. And we have a pretty big tent um, in terms of our beliefs now. So not all of our, uh, not all Unitarian Universalists de these days will use that language. We don't all talk about God. We don't all uh, believe in a personal God and we might not all believe in heaven but we definitely hold on that to that sense of everybody's loved and everybody's precious oh, nice yeah and what was the calling for you to enter ministry and why um, this you know, particular faith? Thank you for asking. It, I, I took sort of a roundabout way. In my childhood, I was not raised in any particular faith. Um, my parents had been religious, but they had really left it behind as, as adults. So for me, what happened was I'm a singer. I, I have some classical voice training. And my voice teacher said, you know what you should really do is go get a job singing in a church. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I had never been to church. And I said, oh, it's going to be so boring. But he was really pushy. So I said, OK, I'll go. And I lucked into getting this job singing for money at a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Boston, Massachusetts, where I was living. And so basically, I tell people they kind of paid me to get converted. I, I, <laughs> I went there to sing in the choir. It, that was my job. But, you know, it wasn't before too long that I found myself just so touched by the message. Um, the hymns we were singing were so beautiful and meaningful to me. The sermons. And wow, I just, I, 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 they just, they just hooked me right in, and I, I loved it. It was just so, I, I'm so lucky that that happened. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And speaking of um, services and everything, a first-time visitor comes to your church. Mm -hmm. What do a family or individual expect? When they come yeah, to your great church. question. Thank you. Well, it, for my congregation, um, if a family comes to church and has children, um, so we have a couple of choices uh, for first-time visitors. Sometimes um, parents and children want to stay together, so everybody's always welcome to be in our main worship service. We have three different worship services each weekend, um, but they're they're um, you know largely the same in format, so you can pick anyone. And um, so kids might choose to stay in the service. 
campus. We also have classes for children and, and young people and teenagers. So um, the, the children might want to go to the classes. They would experience their own age-appropriate worship service and then get to go to classes so they could form some connections with, with kids of their own age. Mm -hmm. um, and then for adults who um, most, most times, um, some of our adults do choose to teach in our religious exploration program okay. with the children. Most of us are in the main sanctuary. And so for a first time visitor, I would say you can expect to um, experience hopefully some, some good fellowship. We're, yeah. we're a pretty friendly congregation, so you'll get greeted for sure. Um, our service has hymns. We do a lot of singing. We have a wonderful music program. Um, we, we have readings, and our readings might be from different scriptures from around the world or maybe from poetry. Um, we have a lot of sources that we draw on. So we're pretty, we're pretty broad-minded and we, we've got a lot of different things that we like to bring into the services. You'll probably hear a sermon most weeks. Um, one of our clergy, perhaps me or perhaps our, our other ministers will preach a sermon and we'll have time for prayer and meditation. Um, so our services are about an hour long and then we have a refreshment time afterwards and oh, uh, we're, we're kind of chatty, so we <laughs> love to chat and get to know oh, people okay. afterwards. Okay, yeah. good, good. Thanks. And um, also, if you mentioned young people, how are they involved in mm -hmm. the community in addition to like taking the classes? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that we really emphasize in our community is social justice. And for the kids, um, we really um, try to help them become aware of social justice uh, issues in our community and around the world in ways that are appropriate for their age. But, you know, a lot of our classes are about helping kids connect and figure out figuring out how they can make a difference. So we have one of our groups is called Families for Social Justice. And so they might uh, participate in a food drive. Um, hunger in our area is one of the issues that we're real involved in. Um, the, some of the older kids are studying um, climate change, environmental issues, um, stuff that's going on in politics around the world and how they can help uh, bring peace in our world. So, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And what are the three key highlights or rituals or holidays, three big things that happen with the yeah. Unitarians. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, I, I always like to, to talk about our, our vision as a congregation. We have a phrase that we talk about a lot, and it, we say that we are about growing, connecting, and serving. So grow, connect, serve is our vision statement. We talk a lot about it. And what that means to me is that we hope that people, when they come and engage in our congregation, they will be growing personally, um, everybody's on their own spiritual journey, and we hope that our congregation is going to give people some tools to, to keep exploring, to keep growing as a person, but then also connecting with, with people in the congregation, um, but, but not just the congregation, to find some way of connecting and bringing our gifts to the larger community. And, and so when we talk about serving, service is really important to, to our community and our faith tradition. Um, to find some way of, of sharing your gifts with the broader world. And it might be explicitly social justice work, or it might be something like teaching, or volunteering in another way, but to find some way of, of really sharing what you have to offer. Um, our mission statement in our congregation is we say that we are here to transform ourselves, our community, and our world with acts of love and justice. So that's what it's all about for us. Okay. And speaking on social justice, can you give examples of initiatives or any activities either here locally, nationally, or internationally that yeah. the Unitarians are involved in? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, um, to, just to start with my own congregation, I would say right now we have four major issues that we're focused on. Um, climate change, I've already mentioned, is a big one for our congregation. A lot of people very concerned about the state of the environment and what people can do to help. So that's one. I also mentioned housing and homelessness. We have a long tradition of advocating. We have um, a lot of folks who advocate um, at, at the county level for policies that will support people who are going through homelessness and having trouble finding affordable housing. Each winter we take a week um, uh, working with FACETS, which is a nonprofit in Fairfax County um, uh, that works to prevent homelessness. We have a week where we uh, host a homeless shelter um, at our congregation. So that's uh, so housing and homelessness is another thing. 
um, and also um, LGBT rights, um, working for equality for people who are gay, lesbian, transgendered, bisexual, very important issue for my congregation. We are a welcoming con congregation and we believe very strongly in equality and equal rights for all people, no matter, no matter what their sexual orientation or gender orientation is. And I just want to add also our, sure. mo most, our most recent initiative. Um, I know that so many of us have been concerned about gun violence. So right now we have a very active group that's working on gun violence pre uh, prevention. So those are, those are our big things oh, right now. That's good, yeah. very active, very yeah. active. Thank you. And how is your church involved in the, in the faith movement? Well, it's interesting. We have we have something that we are exploring right now. Um, our senior minister, whose name is Mary Catherine Morn, she has started to work with a group of clergy in the Tysons area. So we all know in our area that Tysons is um, developing. It's going to be changing so rapidly with the subway line going in. And oh, what yeah. we realized is that there's all these plans for housing going in, but there actually are no religious communities of any kind in the Tysons area right now. Mm -hmm. And so there's a group of, of uh, clergy and congregations, including ours, that are working to think about, well, how could we um, bring a religious presence to Tysons right now as an area that's really changing, it's about to be growing very fast. And so our hope is that down the road, we'll be able to collaborate on an interfaith community center that will be nice. of spiritual benefit to those people in, in our area. And then, you know, we do a lot of other social justice collaborations, but that's a kind of a new thing that's exciting for us. Mm -hmm. And is there anything, I guess, in regards to your faith community or maybe spiritual, spirituality as a whole that you would like to see more people get involved in, maybe peace initiatives? Um. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, certainly we are we are all trying to live our values. Um, we, you know, in I, I guess I would just say that in the broader Unitarian Universalist world, we have a wonderful campaign called Standing on the Side of Love, oh. where we've been trying to get really involved in issues that where we can really make a difference. So another one I haven't mentioned is immigration. Okay. Um, a lot of Unitarian Universalists right now are very involved in pushing for immigration reform. Um, we really believe that it's it's wrong for families to be separated we would like to see compassionate immigration policies in our country um, so that's just another way that we're, we're trying to get involved to make a difference okay and for you any additional um, projects or any um, type of activities or upcoming events that you are involved in or maybe yeah. that your community is involved in yeah that sure does. well one of the one of the things that that I do that that is just um, a source of joy for me is helping people um, find small groups to get to, to be involved in so one of the things that I love about our congregation is um, for people who are new or anybody really we try to make available small groups of about maybe 10 people our congregation is pretty big. We have uh, about 750 adult mm -hmm. members alone, and then uh, hundreds of children also. So you know, we try to we try to make it easy for people to connect and hook in in a small group kind of way, so you can really get to know people. So one of the things that I love to do is just help people find small communities where they can really have connections. I think a lot of people in in, in our country right now are pretty isolated socially, yeah, and they're the mission, looking. Yeah. They're looking for community. They're looking for ways to connect. And so that's one of the things that we really try to offer. And that, it's interesting you mentioned that because that's what I was going to ask you. Um, how, with the small groups or maybe in the activities, how, mm -hmm. do the, how does a congregation connect? Because mm -hmm. I know yeah. some challenges people tend to have like their own kind yeah. of groups. I don't like to use cliques, but uh, they're cliques. Yeah, well, you know, people but have their, their, their yeah. own circles for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm thinking about one group that I have been working with. We have a small group program where um, the people in the group um, commit to doing, they, they choose a spiritual practice that they're gonna follow throughout the year. Something they can do every day. May not be huge, but something they can do every day. And it's actually different for each person, but they commit, like, I've got my practice, you've got yours, and we're gonna do it every day, but then we're gonna come together and talk about how it's going, like how are we each working with that and what is it, what, what, it, 
what kind of transformation is it bringing in our lives? And then, um, to, to, so it doesn't just stop in the small group, we will have, sometimes we will have people um, volunteer to speak in the worship service so that the whole community can hear about, oh, well, this is what this person's doing. This is the practice that they're really trying to go deep with, and this is what they're getting out of it. And I think to hear, um, to hear from, from people in the congregation like that for, for everybody else, it's really exciting. It's really exciting, and it gives a sense of there's a lot of paths, but we can we can be in community and share share together what we're experiencing. Okay. Now back to I will say this time I'll speak to, about young adults. Mm -hmm. How have young adults um, come to the Unitarians in either in search of their spirituality yeah. or maybe not having one or not being raised in a spiritual environment, but yeah. they want to just learn more or see what the message is about or mm -hmm. as they're searching in their spiritual journey. How has young yeah. adults been involved in the church or even in their, in their search? Because I hear that, that more younger people are spiritual but not religious. Mm -hmm. And then we take this like test on a website like beliefnet.com mm -hmm. and I've mm -hmm. talked to people, they said we always score the unit for the Unitarians. Oh, so that's I always wonder too. if yeah. mechanisms like that yeah. also build the interest for people to come to your church just to see what it's about. They're like, oh, oh sure. I scored this yeah. here. Let me see what this, yeah. That, that belief net test has been so interesting. <laughs> yeah. So definitely, I think we do get some young adults who are drawn to that. We also have, we, we have young adults who have been raised Unitarian Universalist. A lot of a lot of people come to, to Washington, D.C. to work or maybe go to school. So right. we, you know, so we, we've um, been lucky to connect with young adults who are here for work or school. Um, but yeah, you know, the whole spiritual but not religious thing, I think that's very common for people to identify that way. And I think that um, Unitarian Universalism is in a great place to serve those people, um, partly because we um, we uh, are open-minded right. in our, um, we're not going to tell you what to believe. We're going to we're gonna share with you the tradition that we have, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's there's room for, for people to find their way with so many different practices. Um, we, we draw in so many different sources of inspiration that I think for some for people who may be turned off by traditional religion will find that being part of a Unitarian Universalist congregation is really stimulating. I think for me, I think of it as there's a lot of freedom to, to go where you need to go in your search, but then to have people with you, to have companions, to have community, is just something that is hard to find outside of uh, some kind of formal religious community. So we're really glad to be able to offer, I think it's something that we can offer our culture at okay. this moment. Yeah. And as far as resources go, if someone wants to learn more about the Unitarians and the, and the whole mm -hmm. movement, or just learn more about the, spirit, you know, the spiritual focus of your faith tradition, is there a magazine, a book, something that yeah. we could Yeah, oh sure. I always think it's easiest to start going to, for people who have uh, web access, you know, mm -hmm. I would send people to the website of the Unitarian Universalist Association, which is uua.org, mm -hmm. it's real easy. Or our own congregational website is uucf.org, so those are easy to remember. That's where I would start. And you know, we have, we have on the UUA website, we have a bookstore that connects to, you know, books for people who want to explore okay. a little bit. I would also encourage folks to look up what are the local congregations in your area and call up a minister. I guarantee you that if a minister gets a call from someone who wants to know about our faith, we will be so happy to talk to that person. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's always good to have like kind of like the open door policy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because I think, especially now, you see on TV, a lot of the high profile ministers, they're, they're so hard to like talk with or connect to. So it's kind of nice when you have like approach where you can just like have a conversation similar to this and just be able to have someone to hear you and hear your concerns or your direction you want to go in your yeah. own spiritual development. Well, I think all of us get into this work because we love people mm -hmm. and we love talking to people and he hearing about their journey. So, okay. yeah. And one last thing, can you share with our audience one fun thing about yourself? Oh, about myself, let's see. Well, I love to ballroom dance. It's been a while, but my husband and I do like to go out dancing now and again, so oh. that brings me joy. Oh, cool. That's, I haven't had a dancer <laughs> cool. on the show. <laughs> on the show. But thank you so much, Laura, for um, oh. this discussion, and I invite you to stay around for our um, next segment. Where we're going to do kind of a comparison um, discussion. Sounds great. Okay. 
and we will be right back on Interfaith Connections. We have seen the faces of suffering in Sudan and Darfur. Over two million people torn from their homes, forced into camps of isolation. But we have seen the hope in a child's face. Catholic Relief Services is there, providing food, water, shelter. The need is urgent. The choice is simple. Watch as another chapter of tragedy is added to history, or act now. Millions of Sudanese wait for hope. That hope begins with you. How far would you go to help someone? Would you go to the end of your driveway? Would you cross a street? Would you cross an ocean? Would you go if you could use your knowledge to teach someone? And in the process, maybe learn something yourself. Life is calling. How far will you go? Peace Corps. Welcome back to Interfaith Connections. I am your host, Jackie Fuller. In our next segment, we're going to do a bit of comparison between two religions that commonly get this confused in a way, but at the same time usually have sim similar and common goals. So we have with us again Reverend Laura, and we have back Reverend Ogan Holder from Unity of Gaithersburg. Now one question, and this is probably a big question for both of you, what do you do when someone comes up to you and say, hey, I heard that you're a Unitarian or that you go to a Unitarian church, but you're a unity minister and vice versa. How do you handle the mix up? Well, I'll go first because that's often a common confusion when I say I am from unity. The very next question is often, oh, is that Unitarian Universalist? And I often have to say, well, I always say no. Um, <laughs> that there, are, there are many similarities. Um, but then rather than talk about what's different, I just describe what unity is about. I describe the unity principles. I describe uh, what being in a unity uh, church experience is like. And that's how I handle that question. Yeah, I think that's that's that feels real similar. Uh, people do get us mixed up a lot, we, but it's a do. flattering mix up, I would have to say. Yes. So in in the case of my congregation right now, we my Unitarian Universalist congregation is about a mile up the street from a Unity congregation. So there's just a world of confusion. We we redirect people a lot, but you know, like you say, there's um, um, there's certainly a lot to there, there's a lot we have in common. I think, yes. but um, it's funny. I was actually talking with another unity minister just the other day and we were talking about the you know how do we explain how we're different and what we came up with is that you know it's 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 dangerous to stereotype but just to float it out I think um, in general my sense is that unity people tend to put the emphasis on sort of personal spiritual development mm -hmm. and Unitarian Universalists tend, tend to emphasize social action work more um, so you know there's always exceptions but that's kind of that's that's one way to to, to Put it out there. I would agree with you entirely. Um, one of the other things that I mentioned is that I think unity tends to um, be more a familiar Christian experience, if you will. Mm -hmm. So in unity, mm -hmm. we the unity teachings are based on the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In a unity church experience, um, we will refer to Bible passages, read mm -hmm. the read the Bible a lot, and I think people who are coming from a more traditional Christian experience find a lot of uh, familiarity um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a unity church. The thing that I also emphasize that we have in common is that experience of expressing the divine, letting the divine within us express how it wants to express, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to you have to make it look a certain way. Yeah, well, that that I really affirm, and I, I think you're right that that in Unitarian Universalist congregations, in most of our congregations, um, you will definitely find people who identify as Christian, mm -hmm. but they might not be the majority. Right. Um, our tradition comes out of Christianity, but at this point, um, we we have um, I would say the majority of our members don't identify as Christian, so we might well um, you know engage with a Bible story, but not necessarily every week. 
unique. Right. Um, we might draw on Buddhist teachings. We might draw on a passage from the Quran. Um, we might draw on you know contemporary literature. Um, so there's there's really just a, a, a range of of world religions that that people are interested in and drawing from. So I think you're right that that you're probably closer to a traditional Christian community. Um, and definitely, we would welcome Christians into our congregations, but it's not the it's it's not the um, the most sure. um, forward note, I would say. And yeah. when you explain it that way, then yeah. we probably are more alike <laughs> than, we, than, than yeah. we are different. Yeah. Um, to yeah. use a phrase that I mentioned last time I was here, um, unity is described sometimes as culturally Christian but spiritually unlimited. So we will often oh, yeah. have references. Mm -hmm. um, um, from Buddhism, mm -hmm. Hinduism, Taoism, mm -hmm. um, it's it's very eclectic, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in today's modern uh, picturing of unity. But the roots, I think, of unity are uniquely grounded um, mm -hmm. in that in those teachings of Jesus and, and the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And how do um, your community? How do you handle challenges? Um, for example, if there's a couple that is having marital challenges. Mm. How do you handle that with um, the couple? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll try that. You know, it's I. That's that's such a tough thing. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that I, as a clergy person, really want to make sure of is that people who are in our congregations who are struggling with difficulties are getting support. You know, I, my 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 sense of what we can offer is. We can't fix people's problems. I would that we could. I wish we could just wave the magic wand and make things easier for people because you know a lot of people are just really struggling with some, some really difficult things in their lives. But I think what we can offer is a sense that they can be heard. Um, in my congregation, um, you, you know, we as ministers are providing pastoral care. We also have wonderful trained volunteers who are doing pastoral care work. And what we really try to do is um, give people a place where they can come and share their stories and to find the healing that, that just comes out of being able to talk and to someone who can try to understand without judgment. Um, and of course, we try to be skillful at connecting them with services. You know, some people might not know where they can go right. for help. Um, sometimes, you know, for our members, we might, if someone's having financial difficulties on top of stuff, we might be able to pay for some counseling, and that's important to us to be able to do. Um, but I think I think that's what most people would find in a Unitarian Universalist con congregation: a sense of. We just want to create a space where someone can be heard, and 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 um, through that, we hope that there can be some healing for them. Sure. And I'll piggyback off that, um, starting with the safe space to be heard. E exactly. That's the, I think what every spiritual um, community provides for their congregants, and also as a resource to make it clear that uh, we as ministers we are not substitutes for for therapy. We're not substitutes for professional counseling. Our, I'll, I'll speak for myself, um, as a minister, our approach is in the spiritual context. So if there is an issue in your life, we can sit and talk with you and be with you and perhaps offer you some spiritual resources that may help in your situation. If you're looking for something more, of course, as you said, we can refer you out to, to professionals. But I think sometimes f folks come to us um, looking for us or hoping that we are a substitute for that. We're not a substitute. I think we're an addition. Uh, we are a supplement. Mm -hmm. We we have people realize that um, I don't that there there's no problem in your life that you can't take a spiritual solution approach to as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I think our role as ministers and spiritual communities are. How can we help you find that spiritual resource, that spiritual tool in your toolbox to um, to address whatever situation it is you're going through at the time in your life? Okay. And I think I would just add that, and that I think. Um, you know, it's not just the professional clergy being able to offer that, but one of the things I think we hope to do is to equip all of our members, everybody in our, everybody in our community, we really see as offering care to each other so that it's not just the one clergy person who's trying to serve all everybody intensely, right. but that we really that we really help people take care of each other. Okay. 
Now, bringing it back, I don't want us to say like all negative with like grief and counseling and so forth, but I am curious, how do you handle the issue of interfaith relationships or interfaith marriages, especially now with, the, they say the world is becoming mm -hmm. smaller with technology and the internet and there's so, and especially in this area where you're around so many different cultures and yeah. How do you, has anyone dealt with an issue where you had two different faiths that are mm -hmm. interested in getting married and seeing that um, your faith traditions are pretty open? How did, did you have any, um, I guess, positive or negative ex challenges or experiences with couples, maybe from different traditions, who want to get married? And in how how do you help those type of couples? Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I just read an article that that is becoming more and more prevalent. It's almost the norm now where we have um, the partners either being of different faiths or one partner, one person is wanting to become more involved in the faith community and explore their faith and the uh, the one isn't. And I would say the same thing I would say about any other issue, whether it's faith, child rearing, finances, parenting, um, open and honest communication before the marriage happens, while after the marriage has happened, you know, while you're living together. Talk about these things, be open and honest, share here is what I want to experience, um, and make sure that your, your desire is not to change the other person. Um, allow them as well the freedom to explore what, however they want to express their faith, however you know, they want to do that. You get to get clarity individual for you if that's a deal breaker or not. And again, we're not in the business as ministers, I believe, of telling people what they should and shouldn't do, what's right and what's wrong. We simply invite people always to consider, to ask questions, to be open, to be honest, to communicate. And like I said, that applies to any issue in relationship, whether it's, again, faith, finances, parenting, you name it, open and honest communication. Yeah, I think that it just, you know, I, I totally affirm what you're saying. And I think I, I'd love to speak from a personal level if I could. I actually am in an interfaith marriage myself. So I'm a Unitarian Universalist, obviously. My husband is a Roman Catholic by, by birth and culture. And um, he, he was lucky enough to spend a number of years in Japan. And, and he developed a, a love of Zen Buddhism as well. So he's kind of, he's, he's involved in, in those communities. And those are not my practices, but we, um, so my experience is being in an interfaith relationship for over 10 years now and I will say it's been an incredible gift. I have learned more from my husband about how to be in relationship with someone of another faith than I think than any other experience I've ever had. Um, I think I, I'm lucky that he's a very open-minded and spiritually curious person, and I, I hope I am too. Um, but I found it just an incredible learning opportunity to, I, I feel like every time I think I'm sure of something um, and get a different perspective, I feel like my own mind and heart and spirit are expanded. So I, um, that's, that's my own personal story. Yes. So <laughs> working with interfaith couples for me is um, very gratifying. I, I think a lot of, for, for Unitarian and universalists, we, we often encounter couples who are interfaith, and a lot of people do end up in our congregations because they're looking for a place where both partners can be comfortable, and um, it, especially if they um, have children or are, are hoping to have children, they're looking for a place where both partners' traditions are going to be respected. Um, so, you know, that's just, that's, that's a part of my work that, that personally is, is very gratifying. And I think as a, as a faith tradition, we're very, very open to, to interfaith couples and families. And I think you mentioned something really important there, which is we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the greatest experiences we can have to learn more about God is from people of other faiths, because then we just don't have our one-sided view of what it needs to be. Yeah. And um, this is a beautiful thing I think our faiths have in common, that idea that, that all paths lead to an expression and an understanding of God. Mm -hmm. and, and we can learn from all of them as well. Okay. Next question I have for both of you. 
newborn baby, they want the baby to be part of your church. Do you have a well, no, christening, baptism, or what is it called, and how is the young one introduced into the new community, their new community? Um, well, in Unity, we, we do have christenings or baby blessings. Uh, what we tend to do, at least I'll speak for Unity of Gaithersburg, what Unity of Gaithersburg tends to do is, however the parents want to um, context it, what is the context they want to use. So for example, we will have people come into our church who may be more um, Catholic in their upbringing, or they may be more Methodist, or they may be Unity, or they may not um, align with any particular faith as adults, but they want their baby to have some kind of blessing. So what we do, and we do this for weddings as well, we sit down and we ask the adults, what does this need to be for you? And how do you want it to look? What's the intention behind it? Do you want a, a, a prayer for the baby? Do you just want a blessing? Do you want, you know, the baby to be blessed with water, oil, even even rose petals? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a I don't want to say it's customizable, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 definitely it definitely is a very personalized experience um, for for the parents and and the family. Because again, we have families coming from many different faith backgrounds and traditions. So how do we create something that really um, can, can touch the heart of each person in that room? How can we create something that speaks to the faith expression of each person in that room? So you come to Unity and you come to five weddings and five baby blessings and they may none of them look the same because it's a very personalized experience. Yeah, that, so thanks for that. I'm, I'm learning a lot about your tradition, and I think we do have some things in common here, too. In, in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, we have a ritual that we call a child dedication, and our approach is that the child is just fine the way they are. The child is perfect. And so what this ritual that we have of dedication is, is the parents or guardians um, dedicate themselves to the care of the child. Um, so in our congregation, twice a year we'll invite families who want to be part of the dedication ritual to, to bring their children on that day and perhaps a, a sponsor or godparent. And um, we, uh, we have a ritual which it, it's, I think it's very similar to what you do. Um, in our congregation we use the symbols of, of water um, as a symbol of purity and our pure intent to love the child and uh, a rose um, to, to symbolize the, the unfolding perfection of the child as, as he or she grows. And really, it's one of my favorite moments to, to, to be with a little baby. Um, we, and we, we um, will often take some water and touch their head, and we might say, um, I touch your head so that you will think clearly, and I touch your lips so that you will always speak the truth and I touch your hands so that you might serve. And then we'll touch their parents and say, we touch your parents so that they will always remind you how much that you are loved. And it's just such a beautiful moment. So, um, so we get to do that um, with families at our congregation. We might also, for some, sometimes families want a more personal and private ceremony, and we might do that as well. But it's, it's a gift to be with these young, young people who Absolutely. are so, so precious. And, and, and we also focus on the baby reminding us of, of our divine purity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think here's another similarity I'm, I'm, I know that we have in common, and I think you may have mentioned it at some point in time, that idea that we are born not of original sin, but of original blessing, mm -hmm. that we are born as divine creations, and there is there's nothing we need to be saved from perhaps as adults our own crazy thinking, but <laughs> you know, uh, at, at our core essence, we, we are divine expressions. And, and often at a baby blessing or, or a christening, we emphasize that fact to the adults in the room that just as this child is, in the, is a divine expression, so, so are we. And again, the commitment gets to be about, about the, the family, the village, ensuring the, the spiritual caretaking of that, of that baby of that child, that's, that's the responsibility as well. Okay. 
And the other item, the flip from birth, death. How does um, your faith community view death? Is it you die and that's it, you're done? Is there a reincarnation process? Or is it just you're going to the next phase? Or you're done and you're done? How is death interpreted? Do you want to take this one? Sure, sure, sure. yeah, you know, within the Unitarian Universalist tradition, there is a wide spectrum of individual belief. I'll say that to start. Um, Unitarian Universalism does not have any official teaching on what, what happens after death. Um, you will find individuals in our congregation who believe a, 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 a range of things. We have people in our congregations who are religious humanists who believe that, that death is um, the, the cessation of personal existence. And, um, and they might find great comfort from the idea of, of living on in people's memories. And then we also have people who do believe in, in some kind of life after death, although um, probably most people that I know would be very hesitant to say what exactly that might look like. Um, I think there's a, there's a humility that we bring, um, a sense of we all have our own um, you know, intuitions, our, certainly hopes, um, we, we can read what other people have thought about this, but that really um, we have to bring our, our humility and our unknowing to the table. So in a Unitarian Universalist memorial service, you would not hear a, a, a clear assurance that the person is in a better place, for example. We will you know, certainly offer our heartfelt hopes and blessings for, for the person who's gone and for the family that, that and friends who are left behind. But I, I think, um, I guess the only other thing that we will say, that, that I would say, is that although there's a range of personal beliefs, um, we got to talk before about the, the core of universalism that's part yeah. of our tradition. And I think the way that that's really carried forward is the sense, I think that most of us would affirm that although we don't know exactly what's coming, um, whatever it is, it's going to happen to everybody. There's no sense of separation like some people get a good deal and some people get a bad deal, right? That everybody, it, whatever it is, it's going to happen to everybody and that it's not anything to be afraid of. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, in essence, this is, this is Unity's um, take as well. Um, and Unity, I think we hold the idea that life is eternal. Not this physical form, but but our spirits are eternal. Um, what that may look like afterwards, we don't know. But we believe it's love. Uh, we we believe God is expressed as love. We are from love, and we will return to love. Um, if there is an official unity view on the afterlife, that may be it. Um, but like you said, very different personal opinions. Some people in unity communities also believe in reincarnation. Some people just believe in that uh, return to love. Um, some people don't know. Some people are skeptical. Um, but uh, at a funeral, for example, or a celebration of life is more likely what you would, you would call it in unity. Um, this is what we say, that, that life is eternal and, and this person is in a place of love. Unless, of course, again, we, we, are, we are personalizing these uh, services very much. So for some individuals, they may not want such language to be used simply, again, for the sake of this being a time that honors all involved. Um, so again, it's never, about, it's never about us imposing our views. It's about you know, what, how is a person's faith wanted to be expressed in any uh, given moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the next question is for you. Um, Ogan, because I didn't get a chance to ask you on the last um, time you were on the show. What is metaphysics? Because people are watching The Secret and they're reading all these books about law of attraction and creating yeah. vision boards. I mean, what is, what is metaphysics? It sounds like something science related. It's, uh -huh. And maybe it may cause some confusion, like saying, are you Christian science because you believe in metaphysics? So what is metaphysics? Okay. Um, so metaphysics, if you look at the word meta beyond physics, the physical, 
Metaphysics really is dealing with that which lies beyond what we can see or detect with our five senses. And in unity, when we speak of metaphysics, we speak of it more in a theological context. So in unity for us, beyond what we can see, there is a spiritual realm, uh, if you can call it that, that our spirit, our soul, our spirit um, exists in us, beyond us, it is timeless, and there are certain spiritual principles that are kind of the underlying functioning of the universe. Um, so one of those spiritual principles, for example, which I think I mentioned last time and I'll mention again, is that we can create our experience through the power of our thinking. And I think this is where things like the secret and the law of the attraction um, come out of, that idea that with, with the power of our, our very thinking, we can um, alter our experience here in this physical world. Um, what I would say, the, how, how Unity really interprets this is that it's less about, as in the Law of Attraction and Secret, the accumulation of material goods. It's, less, it's not so much about that, but truly the experience of how do we want to be in this world? Do we want to live in this world from a place of fear, from a place of scarcity, or do we want to live in this world from a place of courageous love? Do we want to live in this world from a place of realizing that this is an abundant universe and that our needs will be met and taken care of? And um, from changing our thinking about these things, we can change our consciousness. And our consciousness, and again, when I use the word consciousness, I'm really speaking about our spiritual connection to our true divine core. When we can change how that outpictures, it changes how we see the world, it changes how we show up in the world, it changes how we experience the world. And if we see it differently and we are different, then we're gonna have a different experience. And along the way, things will be in flow and it will look like life is much easier. Um, so I'll give you the example of, and we talked about this last time when I was publishing my book. I wrote the book, or I started writing the book, and I, you know, I did some research about publishing. Should I self-publish? Should I find a traditional publisher? Should I get a literary agent? All these questions were in my mind. And I was becoming stressed by it. So um, what I did was I prayed. And in unity, our prayer is less about beseeching a God out there to fix our situation, and more about affirming the universal and spiritual truths of ourselves. So I continually affirm for myself, this is an abundant world. I am in the flow of ease and grace. And when the time comes for me to publish this book, it will be an easy, graceful um, experience for all concerned. So I, I, I continued to affirm this as I was writing, and as I shared last time, the publishing house, Unity's publishing house, they approached me about publishing the book. I didn't have to go out and, and struggle and look for a publisher. Um, and, and it was still, you know, we sit, had to sit down and negotiate terms and, and, and all that. It, it, it still was a real world experience. But for me, it was ease and grace flow. Uh, so that's that's the idea of how our consciousness really, with our with shifting our consciousness, we can co-create this experience that we that we want to have. You know, I wonder if I could jump in. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I, really, I really appreciate hearing what you have to say because, you know, that really gives me a different um, a different way of thinking about some of these ideas. You know, I'm familiar with the, the secret a yes. little bit, and the part that I think. As a Unitarian Universalist, the, the the sort of question, if not criticism, that I that I always have in my mind is, I, I think it's great when people apply that to themselves about right. how can I use, how can I transform my own outlook. Mm -hmm. Where I get fearful is worrying about those ideas being put on other people and used as a sort of justification for like why are some people, you know, why do some people struggle and have very yes. very difficult life experiences? I think it's so dangerous to try to apply those. Ideas ideas to anybody else but yourself um, so it's really it's it's really refreshing to for, for me to hear you talk about that and, and you know you know what I'm saying I know what you're saying we yeah. actually have a term for that in unity we call it metaphysical malpractice oh. <laughs> uh, as a humorous uh -huh. bent of saying because yeah. because some people take that teaching and and they they say to themselves well 
my life is a mess, so what am I doing wrong? Or, or they may impose it on others yeah. when they see others suffering. Well, what was in your consciousness or what did you think about mm -hmm. to make this happen in, in your life? Mm -hmm. That's not how this tool is, is to be used at all. And, and we have to be very conscious about how we do it. You know, uh, it reminds me of one of my favorite uh, Bible stories where the disciples brought a blind man to Jesus. It's in the book of John, I believe. And they asked Jesus who sinned that this man maybe was born blind. Because at the time they believed, you know, physical disability was the result of sin. So they said, was it his parents that sinned because he was born blind, so therefore they sinned as his punishment? Or maybe, you know, he must have had some kind of sin, I don't know, as a baby or something, you know, pre-life that, he was born blind as well, and Jesus replied, neither. This man was born blind so that the fullness of God can be expressed. So what I take from that story is that it's never a good idea to focus on causality. It's never a idea to, good idea to focus on blame. It's about how can we use these spiritual principles to create the experience we want moving forward. Next question. Leadership, Catholics have the Pope, you have Amans. Who is like top dog or who is the leader <laughs> of your movements? Do you have a governing body? Is it an individual? And how does that individual or governing body affect all your faith communities and any other type of activities that your traditions have or to do in public? Um, Unity has an interesting leadership setup. I'll start with that. Um, we actually have two governing bodies in the sense. One is called uh, the Unity School. And Unity School is in charge of many of Unity's uh, services around the world, some of which you might be familiar with. The Daily Word publication, um, which is a, uh, like a daily um, scriptural meditation inspirational book. Um, you, you may have heard about it recently on some of Oprah's interviews when she in interviewed uh, Jason Collins, the basketball star that just um, came out and shared with the world that, that he was gay. They talked about him growing up as a kid reading the Daily Word publication. Mm -hmm. um, that's a Unity publication. Unity also has um, Silent Unity, which is a 24-hour-a-day prayer service that you can call into at any time. I think it's 1-800-NOW-PRAY. And you can find out all of these at unity.org, the website. So there's, uh, there's the Unity School that takes care of all of that. They have, they have a publishing house. They are in charge of the seminary that, that trains ministers and equips ministers. And then we also have Unity Worldwide Ministries. And this is a sister organization that supports the Unity churches around the world. They provide resources for Unity churches. They help Unity ministers get started um, if they want to pioneer a church or start a church. Um, they help with the placement and hiring of Unity ministers in churches. So we have these two sister organizations. But the thing about Unity that is, I think, very special is that Unity churches are entirely autonomous. So a Unity church, as far as a Unity church goes, the senior minister is the leadership of, of the church. Um, the Unity organization, yes, we have certain, um, you know, I would say, I don't want to call them rules, but um, recommendations on how to function as a healthy church body. But Unity churches are autonomous. You can go to 15 Unity churches and have 15 different, you know, experiences in how these, in, in, in your Sunday morning experience, which I think speaks to the eclectic beauty of the congregants who walk in the door but I think it's also speaking to the eclectic beauty that is God. You know, when we look at nature, when we look at humanity itself, there are no two things that are the same, and, and we get that in unity as well. 
Laura? Yeah, well, you know, and we, we have some commonalities and some differences, I think. So within Unitarian Universalism, uh, this question of how are we organized is actually a really important part of our self-identity. So in Unitarian Universalism, we have con congregations. Um, there actually is no hierarchical governing body over our congregations. So there's no Unitarian Universalist pope or bishops or council of elders. Mm -hmm. However, our congregations do freely choose to enter into association. So we do have what's called the Unitarian Universalist Association. And um, this actually goes back all the way to the very first European settlements in this on this continent. So the Puritans um, who came over from England, um, they came over because they were looking for religious freedom. And when they got here, they found that they could be independent of the established church. And they decided that the way they wanted to organize themselves was to have congregations who could make their own decisions, but that would be in relationship with, for, with each other. So support, advice giving, um, common resources. And so it's, it's a longer story than we have time for about how the Puritans got to be, at least some of them got to be Unitarian Universalists. Oh, but but yeah. it goes all the way back and we've always, we've always organized ourselves like that. So um, independent but collaborating. Okay, and final question. Are there any dietary restrictions in your faith tradition? Well, I'll just, the simple answer is no. Um, <laughs> however, I would say that there certainly are a lot of Unitarian Universalists who think a lot about what they eat. Um, a lot of us care about um, sustainability on our planet. So I think um, it's most Unitarian Universalists have thought about what, what, am, what choices am I making with my eating and how can I best support sustainable life on this planet? Short answer, also no. <laughs> um, but Unity's history has been interestingly very strongly vegetarian. Uh, the founders, uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, when they started Unity in the Midwest, Kansas City, uh, they bought a farm just outside the city, or some land, which they started a farm, and they grew their own crops. And they were um, very um, firm in their belief that vegetarianism was the way to go, that it promoted healthy eating, healthy bodies, healthy minds, which led to healthy minds, which led to healthy thinking, which led to healthy consciousness. So it was all connected. But um, today, there's no restriction about it. The question we always ask ourselves is, how is this serving us? So whatever we do, whether it be the food we take, uh, the we eat, the you know what we do for entertainment, what we read, whatever it is, whatever action we take in our job, we always ask the question, how is this serving us in deepening our consciousness? How is this serving us in allowing us to express more fully the God of who we are? So it's very self-determinant. Okay, well thank you so much, Rebs, for um, coming on the You're show, welcome. doing this comparison <laughs> thank you, round with us. Thank you so much, I appreciate it, and feel free to come back anytime on the program. We appreciate you coming out. And thank you for watching Interfaith Connection, and see you next time. Bye-bye.